Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Uh, today I'd like to introduce the concept of isotopes and ions to you. The latter probably being a little bit more important at this level. There's a lot that we do with ions and so mastery of them is, is a really critical skill. Isotopes, uh, more of a curiosity at this level, but we will teach you how to do an isotopic average, which will be fun. Uh, a real quick side note, if you are interested in atomic history at all, like the work of Thompson, Rutherford, Curie, um, um, Chadwick that we're going to talk about today, I highly recommend the book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb, because you'll see where a lot of these early atomic scientists uh, did their work and how they fit into each other's work and how that eventually led to the process of, 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 of even conceiving of the atomic bomb into the actual development of it. So if you want to see where science and engineering meet with society and science and politics, you really can't go for a better book than The Making of the Atomic Bomb. And that's by uh, Richard Rhodes. So check it out. Anyway, Chadwick's given credit for the discovery of the neutron in 1932. Uh, Rutherford's generally given credit for the discovery of the proton earlier on. Um, people knew there was something else inside the nucleus because predicted masses of the nuclei were not uh, matching up with the measured masses of uh, the nucleus. And so they were undervaluing what the actual values were. And so people realized there was probably some kind of neutral particle in there. And as the atomic numbers got bigger and bigger, there was a bigger disparity between the predicted and measured values. Now, now Chadwick built off the work of other scientists, uh, specifically Irene Jolet Curie and her husband. Um, uh, that is, by the way, the niece of Marie Curie. Uh, and uh, they, they did a lot of work and they just, they just flubbed the analysis of their data. And so Chadwick was able to come in, see where they made the mistakes, and then he got credit for uh, the interpretation that led to the discovery of the neutron. Um, and that wouldn't be the first time that those two, Irene and Frederic, uh, missed out on a big discovery, barely, either through time or just misinterpreting data. Now, they would eventually uh, get credit for uh, some radiation work they did and ended up winning the Nobel Prize in 1935. But a really interesting uh, scientific power couple. And uh, you know you can only imagine the frustration of working and stuff and having idea after idea get so close and then missing out on it. So hats off for them for the 1935 Nobel Prize. And so isotopes, uh, really uh, isotopes are atoms with differing number of neutrons. Although you could argue that every atom is an isotope. It's just that certain elements only have one isotope available to them. Uh, uh, but other elements, and you can look these charts up on the internet, have a variety of isotopes of different percents. Like for example, carbon-12 and carbon-14 are out there in nature. Now you have a lot more carbon-12 than carbon-14. Um, the only thing that differentiates carbon-12 from carbon-14 is the number of neutrons. And, and that's why uh, it's still carbon. They each have six protons. If I change the number of protons, I'd have a different element. And again, there are a lot of practical applications of isotopes. And here, probably the limit of what we'll do with isotopes is calculate an isotopic average. And so you'll just take the percents of the isotopes and then multiply them by the relative the atomic mass. Now, I'm doing this with two um, isotopes, 90% and 10%, but you could do this with 10 if you had 10. You just eat, multiply each percent by its average atomic mass and then add them all up. Um, if, you, if you want to use the percents, then you have to divide it by 100% when you're done. So I encourage you to practice these on your own a little bit. You can look up an isotopic average chart and then do some of these calculations yourself. It doesn't take long to master, but you want to make sure you certainly can, can do this before there's any kind of formal evaluation in your class. Isotopes are written in a way that you might not expect. A lot of people expect to see atomic numbers up high and atomic mass down low, and that's not how isotopes are written. Now, it doesn't really matter. I mean, the bigger number is going to be the atomic uh, mass, and the smaller number is going to be the atomic number, wherever it is. But nonetheless, don't get freaked out by this. Um, hydrogen uh, is, is such a unique isotope that it gets its own name. Uh, uh, H2 is called deuterium. That, that, that's an isotope of hydrogen that has one proton and one neutron. Remember, hydrogen typically only has one proton and one electron. Um, there's deuterium and tritium. Tritium gets a little bit of a shout out in the Spider-Man movie when he had to fight Doc Ock. They needed tritium to, I guess, run his little fusion thing you do. Um, deuterium, though, gets a lot more real-world fame. Heavy water uh, is used in a lot of experimentation um, and, and, and a lot of, of nuclear work um, due to its ability to kind of slow stuff down that travels through it a little bit. Um, and in fact, that's one of the ways that the Allies knew that the Germans were uh, seriously after an atomic bomb because when they when they invaded uh, Scandinavian countries, they went after the heavy water plants. Uh, and so that was a big sign of them saying, you know what, uh, 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 Berlin's really after this atomic bomb. 
Um, by the way, Heavy Water, also a, a big plot point in, in one of my favorite G.I. Joe episodes as a youth. They, of course, in G.I. Joe, they found it at the bottom of the ocean because it was heavy. But nonetheless, they tried. Now, anyway, the uh, atomic numbers just disappeared there uh, because we really don't need them. You, you know that carbon has six protons, so I don't need to put that number there. And you know that hydrogen has one. So again, chemists like to avoid redundant information, just like Answer Dog is telling you right there. Thanks, Answer Dog. Now, ions are probably more important at this level because ions are really deeply embedded in naming and all kind of chemical reactions. Uh, atoms start electrically neutral, the same number of protons and electrons, but they don't want to stay that way. Most don't. Stability actually comes from gaining a certain number of valence electrons, uh, obtaining a full outer shell. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about the periodic table in the next lecture. Uh, but, but just because you have the same number of protons and electrons, that doesn't mean you're happy as an atom. And so atoms will often gain or lose electrons. They don't gain or lose protons. Protons are deep down in the nucleus. Uh, it's the electrons they gain or lose. And we indicate this by a superscript. So for example, magnesium will become more stable by losing two electrons for, again, reasons that will become apparent in the very near future. Uh, so by losing two electrons, if you think about it, that leaves two protons in the nucleus that are unpaired against electrons, so that reveals a plus two charge. Um, uh, fluorine, on the other hand, when it gains one electron, uh, now has an unbalanced negative charge. So you either gain electrons and you gain the negative charge with it, one for each electron, or you, you reveal the positive charge uh, that's always there uh, by losing the electrons that shielded it. So again, this is another one of those things that you have to make your own. I encourage doing some drawings and showing where all the protons and electrons are and showing that how they, they become balanced and unbalanced. Uh, but the sooner you kind of master the basics of ions, the better off you'll be. Now, there are two types of, of ions, ions that have gained electrons and ions that have lost electrons. Uh, if, you have, if you have lost electrons, you're considered a cation. And we have our friend there, Plessy Cat, <laughs> to help you out. I didn't come up with that idea, by the way. Um, so if you look at that general equation, the element M becomes uh, a cation, M plus, and the electron. That plus means they're now separate. All right, so if it's you and your shoes, uh, you know, you come into the house uh, fully dressed, and then you become you and your two shoes on the floor. So whenever you separate things out, you add the plus sign. All right? Anions are just the opposite. Uh, they want to gain an electron. So there they are sitting looking at an electron that they want to internalize, and then they do before and after. And then they obtain that negative charge that way. So again, it's all about gaining or losing electrons. Cations are producing electrons because they don't want it, and anions are consuming electrons. And the sooner you get that under your belt, the better. And that's where you end up with the ides that you guys know about, oxides and sulfides that come from um, that idea of, of losing, I mean, gaining electrons. A little witty banter between these two. Koala makes an appearance. Now lastly, and, and I'm overstepping probably the, the limits of what we want to do with today's uh, discussion, but uh, the periodic table has a lot of information, so if you have one handy, you might want to take a peek at it. The groups of the periodic table the atoms in those groups uh, tend to have certain common charges after they gain or lose electrons to become stable. I'm going to give you these charges now, even though we haven't talked about the background behind it, um, because I figure the more you see this, the better off you'll be. But this is a really important chart. Group one, elements want to lose one electron. That, gives them a that reveals a plus one charge. Group two wants to lose two electrons, revealing a plus two charge, etc to group, th group uh, 13. We skipped the transition metals for now. We'll talk about why later. And so aluminum's group wants to lose three electrons. And then you skip group 14. 15, 16, and 17 uh, are gaining negative charges because they're gaining electrons. Group 15 is going to want to gain three. Group 16 wants to gain two. Group 17 wants to gain one most of the time. And again, group 18 doesn't want to form ions. And again, those answers will become a little bit more apparent as we work our way through the periodic table. And so what you should be able to do is take what we had on the last slide and combine it with this slide. And so you should be able to put in uh, actual elements. And so I encourage you to try this. You know, take something like potassium, say, well, potassium's group one. Group one wants to get a plus one charge. You get a plus one charge by losing an electron. And that's how you'd write that. Same with calcium, it's got to lose two. So that's how you would write that. Oxygen, on the other hand, wants to gain electrons. And so the electrons are going to be in the left-hand side because oxygen wants to eat them and then become O2 minus. 
Um, and so, again, we're going to talk a lot more about that later, but time well spent now trying to get this under your belt. You really need to be able to conceptually read those and say that makes sense. And don't forget, remember that the protons determine the identity. So, again, that, that, this ran a little over today, but I think it was worth it to cover some of those basics, put some seeds in your head there. So, I uh, hope you got something out of this. Uh, thanks for watching, and have a great day.